Good evening, everyone. I uh, really appreciate you coming out to the Global Diseases Voices from the Vanguard lecture on such a, oh no, I'm changing the slides now for this man. Uh -oh. uh, we'll try not to do that again. Never lean on someone else's laptop. Anyway, as many of you know, my name is Pat Thomas. I teach health and medical journalism at the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication. And this lecture series is a joint effort of mine and Dan Polly, the head for the center of the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases and a microbiologist, actually a parapsychologist. And this is the seventh year that we've done this lecture series. We are delighted that it's uh, established such a following in the community. And today, I think uh, we, we have set a new record for a lecturer who's traveled the greatest distance. I think Geneva to Athens was our previous uh, record. But uh, Matt LeBreton has come to join us from Yaoundé, Cameroon, which is uh, quite a distance. And I am so excited about having him here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Global Viral Forecasting Initiative, but there's no other organization in the world that I know of that has done such extraordinary work in trying to probe how pathogens make that crucial leap from non-human species into us. It's a very important area of work. And their idea is that uh, if you know enough, you can figure out how to head off pandemics, pand potentially pandemic diseases, before they, before they kill a lot of us. Uh, so we all kind of have a stake in this work. And it's really great to have this at UGA at a time when UGA is also making new efforts. Susan Sanchez is here from the vet school, and she's a coordinating a new One Health initiative, which means bringing your resources to bear from veterinary medicine, human medicine, biomedical research, and ecology research to try to figure out these things before they get really bad. So today, and I want to thank also a couple of other supporters. I'm so sorry this wasn't on the, on the program itself, but the Center for Integrative Con Conservation Research, another interdisciplinary area, and uh, Pete Brosius and Meredith Welch Devine uh, have helped support this and bring Matthew here. And also the President's Venture Fund uh, helped fund this. They have helped us in the past, and we are uh, so grateful. It's not cheap to put on these lectures and bring these great world-class scientists here. Uh, at any rate, today I think that we're in for a really, really interesting uh, time. Uh, what, are, what is the observation of animals and ecology? telling us about future patterns of human disease. That's what Matt's going to talk about. I'm not going to recite his bio. You can, you can read that, but I will tell you that uh, my lunch with him today just persuaded me that uh, he is a fascinating repository of knowledge, maybe some trivia too now and then, about uh, people, animals, disease, and even the future. So let's welcome uh, Matthew LeBreton. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to come and talk here today. Um, it's been great to be able to visit Athens for the first time. You're um, all very lucky to be able to live in such a, a wonderful place. So I'm, I'm working for an organization that's called Global Viral Forecasting, and one of the roles that we have as an organization is to try and think about where viruses come from, where pandemics come from, and how can we head them off? How can we prevent them? And Given that the title of this lecture series is the, the Voices from the Vanguard, I wanted to try and think of that from a slightly different perspective and kind of really ask the question, um, you know, where, where is the front line in the battle against infectious diseases? You know, is it, is it in the, the response to epidemics? So this is a photo from uh, the, the great influenza epidemic in 1919. This is a photo from Australia when they converted um, convention centers and halls just like this one into places where they could receive patients and treat uh, people who are infected with uh, infectious diseases? Is it the way we deal with uh, the movements of people during pandemics, detecting them using thermal imaging uh, technology to try and work out what people should be put into quarantine or treated or uh, uh, prevented from traveling uh, to try and prevent the spread of, of diseases? Is the front line in services we provide to people who are infected or who want to know whether they're infected for diseases like HIV? 
the clinical uh, aspects of treatment of disease, and even just the knowledge of whether or not someone's infected. And these are important for many reasons. People who are infected with a disease can have great impact on people around them through their behavior. And people who are not infected can change their behavior to prevent them from acquiring those diseases. So all of these are ways that uh, we can think about the front line. Another way would be to think about the SARS epidemic uh, and the, uh, the kinds of facilities and hospitals that were dealing with cases that were coming in. All of these are really important parts of the front line in uh, uh, the treatment and the, the, the fight against pandemic disease. But I want to talk about it in a slightly different way uh, today. Almost all of those viruses, all of those um, diseases that I just mentioned, uh, originate in animals. And in fact, over 60% of all of human infectious diseases originated in animals. If we just consider the viruses that have emerged in the last, or the pathogens that have emerged in the last 40 or 50 years, the kinds of viruses that we would call new or emerging infectious diseases, then it's in fact over 70% of those infectious diseases originate in animals. So obviously there's a, there's a great need to be studying uh, organisms that originate in animals, pathogens that, that, are, that are lurking in, in, in wildlife populations to try and work out what's out there that may be able to cross over, enter into human populations, and go on to cause pandemics. So there's a few different examples of some of the, the kinds of viruses that have crossed over. Um, this is work done by Nathan Wolf, the founder of our program, uh, Global Viral Forecasting. Um, and I want to give an example specifically of, of Ebola. Uh, Ebola is a virus that um, was only discovered uh, 40, 50 years ago. So it's one of these viruses that we can consider really a new virus, uh, at least a new, a new human virus, but only because we discovered it recently, not because it really is a new virus. Ebola hem hemorrhagic fever outbreaks occur almost exclusively after people find dead animals in the forest and, and touch them for one reason or another, to bring them back into villages or to, to touch the, these animals that they're finding in the forest. And those animals themselves have, have died from Ebola. The animal populations in the areas around the Ebola outbreaks continue to decline during human Ebola outbreaks. And that really indicates that if we undertake surveillance for animal die-off events, we can actually put in place a warning system to uh, indicate when Ebola outbreaks may occur in human populations. This is work that's being done uh, particularly by some of our colleagues in Gabon from the National Medical Research um, uh, Center in Franceville, uh, Eric Leroy and uh, Jean-Paul Gonzalez. So when people are finding uh, animals dead in the forest, this is a, a gorilla that was found dead as part of, uh, during some of our surveillance work. When people are finding animals dead like this in the forest, if they are t touching them or handling them or collecting parts of these animals, um, if those animals are dead from Ebola, bringing those, uh, that infection, bringing that virus back into the, into the village or into the town can create these infection chains um, that can get into, into local communities. And these infection chains are actually quite easy to shut down with the right kind of barrier techniques, the right kind of uh, hygiene within hospitals. Um, but without that, they can go on to cause extensive uh, outbreaks. Um, not only can we shut those infection chains down quite easily within the context of hospital systems, but we can also go one, one step further back and say, if we are seeing animals dying off in forests, and if those die-offs are related to, uh, to Ebola outbreaks, then in fact we can prevent Ebola from actually crossing over in the first place. We can prevent people from, or we can, in, we can educate people on how Ebola is getting into these communities in the first place and encourage them to, to not do the kinds of behavior that would allow that virus to get into the community. So in this case, um, this is a poster produced um, by the Ministry of Health that was uh, instructing people to avoid collecting dead monkeys, uh, dead chimpanzees, or dead gorillas that they find in the forest. But so Ebola is a particular kind of example. You can see that um, it's both SARS and Ebola, uh, but Ebola to a lesser extent, it can cross over and cause infection chains, but it's not really, it's not really well adapted to humans. We can quite easily, within the right kind of clinical setting, shut down these, uh, these outbreaks. And as much as Ebola creates, um, can create a, a psychosis, and it is one of these really dramatic diseases, in fact, it's not a very it's not a, a disease that's very good at what it does, at creating uh, large epidemics. Rabies, I guess if we go back one step even further, rabies again, uh, a virus that crosses over from, uh, from infected animals into people, um, almost never causes more than one case per animal bite. 
So this is a virus that is in fact very poorly adapted to people, even though the, the effects on the individual uh, are, are quite extreme. It's, uh, it's very, very rare that someone will survive from, uh, from a case of, uh, of rabies infection. Other viruses such as HIV-1, uh, which also originated in wild animals, in, in primates in Central Africa, have gone on to cause global pandemics that don't require any reinforcement from the animal reservoir. And it's this cross-species this cross transmission that goes on to create these massive pandemics that are one of the things that we need to be watching out for. These, these, these viruses that can adapt very well to the human population, to the human organism, and can create dramatic impact. So if we want to ask the question, we know that a, a whole series of these viruses crossed over from wild animals into people. We know that that's happened in the past. We know that it's happening now. And we know that it's going to continue to happen. We know we're going to find new viruses out there. So we really have to ask the question, how are we going to find all of those viruses? Where are we going to look? And how are we going to find them? And the first problem that we have is really the question of how many species exist on, on the planet. We've described something like a million different species. Um, we, the scientific community, community not, not our organization um, personally. There are around nine million species that are probably, probably exist on Earth that, um, that are waiting to be discovered or are waiting to be described. It's probably something we'll never achieve. Uh, probably not using this, the, the kinds of systems we have for describing organi organisms at the moment. We're only at a very early stage of understanding exactly what's out there. And importantly, that figure of 9 million species doesn't even include viruses. So the diversity of viruses that exist out there is actually beyond these estimates that we've, we've created for, for working out how many species uh, of, of cellular life actually exist. So firstly, we have to ask the question, you know, viruses require, in general, cellular life to replicate. So that's where we should be looking. We should be looking at organisms to see what viruses are out there that might be a potential threat to us. But of course, we can't detect all the viruses of all of these 9 million different species. We need to kind of focus in a little bit and find strategies to, to, to hone in on the things that are a, a, a higher risk. Mammals are a good place to start. Um, again, Nathan Wolf, the founder of our organization, um, uh, analyzed some of the data related to human infectious diseases and found that in fact, of the 60% of all infectious diseases, or the 70% of, uh, of, of emerging infectious diseases that originated in animals, um, almost all of those came from, from mammals. So in fact, mammals are a really good place that we could probably start. The 70% of mammals, in fact, are made up by rodents, bats, and primates, three really important groups that we could probably be focusing on, and in fact, three groups that are already very important and well known to be um, origins of very particular uh, human diseases. So this is probably a good place to start uh, looking for, for some of these new, new viruses that may be out there. Unfortunately, it gets a little, also gets a little bit complicated. There are around 5,500 different described species of mammals. And in the last 20 years, we've actually described another 400 species of mammals. That's about a new species of mammal every week, uh, sorry, every three weeks. And that means that even if we discover all of the viruses that occur with, amongst all of this diversity of, uh, of, of wild animals, we'll still need to be restarting our analyses every three weeks as we discover these new species of mammals to ensure that we really understand the complete diversity uh, of, of, of all of the, the microorganisms that may be occurring within these mammal species. And you know, I think that's probably a, good, a really good point of where we need to to make the point that what we do know about viruses, what we do know about parasites that come from these mammal species, it's really important to have a way of collecting that data and analyzing that data and knowing what's being discovered. Um, because it's very easy to collect data and to put it out there into a scientific paper, but it's much more difficult to compile all of that information and have access to it. And UGA has been key in the initiative for the Global Mammal Parasite Database uh, in developing this database as a resource for uh, researchers who want to really understand what are the different viruses, what are the different parasites that are out there in, uh, in wildlife. Um, so I commend uh, UGA's involvement in, in that kind of initiative. Um, as I was saying, the discovery of mammals is still ongoing. This is for some of our data on bat species in Cameroon. 
And you can see that 150 years ago, we started to really think about, scientifically at least, what kind of um, bats were occurring in Cameroon, started describing them scientifically, recording and, uh, and doing inventories of bats. And that work is progressively continuing. Um, you can see the angle of this line is continuing to rise. Um, we still haven't found all of the species that there are to be found in Cameroon of bats. We're almost at 100 different species, but this, this line is going to continue to rise. We're going to find more species uh, occurring in Cameroon. So again, we still don't even know of these very important groups, um, a very small group of a group of mammals, which are a group of animals, a small part of these 9 million species. We still don't know everything there is to know. So we can only start to really, scra only really start scratching the surface of what kind of pathogens might be out there. Even if we say that we do know um, all of the different species that occur, um, that doesn't mean to say that we know where they occur. So for instance, in Cameroon, if we compile all of the different records of where anyone has um, recorded data on species of bats and where they occur in Cameroon, there are a lot of gaps. You can see places where um, it's more difficult to access, where roads, are, um, roads aren't so, so, so well developed. Uh, where there are less people, where there are less, less activity in, in research, meaning just we have very few records of these species. And this is really key because even if we do understand the different species that are involved, it's not just going to be one sample from one species from one location that will answer the question, what viruses exist in that species? We're going to need multiple um, samples coming from multiple locations to be really certain that uh, we have a good idea of what kind of viruses occur out there. This data, in fact, indicates, this, this map indicates not even the samples that we have available, but this is actually just the data that's available in terms of locations where bats have been found. So if we want to actually go further and say we need to analyze samples and we only plot the, sam the, the locations where we have samples from animals, this map would be a lot more, a lot more empty. Um, collecting samples for disease diagnostics is, can be uh, incredibly complicated, and uh, the conditions you need for conserving the samples to get them to the laboratory uh, very expensive, so it would be a, a much smaller subset of, of these records that we would have in terms of available records for analysis for disease. So if that's the case, we need to develop models to help us focus our efforts. We can't be collecting everything. Um, we don't even have the knowledge or the tools for, for identifying all of the different organisms that are out there or knowing their distributions. So we need to have models that can really help us to de determine where should we be focusing our efforts. So this is work being done by colleagues from the Zoological Society of London and EcoHealth Alliance. And what they looked at was all of the zoonotic disease events uh, from wild animals uh, that were occurring throughout the world. They then looked at what are the underlying factors that may describe or indicate why these zoonotic disease events were, were occurring. And they found two very important things. The first one was human population density. And the second one was the underlying diversity of wildlife. And when you put those two elements together um, and use it to try and predict the way that zoonotic disease events from wild animals are, are, are presenting themselves worldwide, this is the kind of risk map that you get. This, area, this indicates the kind of places that we should be focusing on to try and determine um, what, what, what new organisms may be crossing over into human populations from wild animals. So this really gives us a a tool that we can use to use the limited resources we have to focus our, our, our research efforts, our surveillance efforts. So this is a really at a macro scale, and I want to zoom in a little bit to the Democratic Republic of Congo um, and to one of, one of the, the districts of the De Democratic Republic of Congo where there is currently endemic transmission of monkeypox. And monkeypox is now the most important pox virus uh, that occurs in the world. The elimination of smallpox was key a key event in, uh, in human history, and its absence now means that monkeypox is one of the most important pox viruses that occurs. It causes hundreds of cases, hundreds of human cases a year, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, it's a, a terrible, terrible infection, very painful infection, and it causes uh, up to 10% mortality. People get this infection through contact with infected animals or from, from people. Um, but we still know very little about, surprisingly, very, very little about the modes of transmission and the kinds of animals that you could get this virus from. And it's actually of emerging importance because since we've stopped uh, vaccination for smallpox, there's a declining immunity to monkeypox. Smallpox 
vaccinations give some, some kind of protection against uh, monkeypox uh, infections so that now that those immunization levels are dropping, we're seeing in some cases over the last 20 years a 20-fold in increase in incidence of monkeypox. And this is work that we've been doing with colleagues from University of California, Los Angeles, Professor uh, Anne Ramoyne, and colleagues from the Kinshasa School of Public Health and the National Medical uh, Research Institute in Kinshasa. So looking at, looking at the di distribution of these kinds of infections in uh, the Sankuru, which is one of the districts in, uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, if we look at the distribution of, of cases of monkeypox, so these are individuals or small groups of individuals that are having infections of monkeypox, and we overlay that with data on climate, on vegetation, on population, on uh, all kinds of different uh, um, geographic layers, we can try and work out what are the things that best predict these cases. And that allows us to, 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 um, to have tools that we can use to explore the landscape, to better ask our questions. Where does this virus come from? How is it transmitted? And this is work that we're doing also with another group at UCLA from the Center for Tropical Research uh, Laboratory of, of Tom Smith. So when we do these maps, then we, we get this idea that um, these areas, these areas in brown at the, the top of the map are the areas where you have both high levels, um, high risk of monkeypox, uh, and you have also high levels of population. So these are the areas that we really should be focusing our efforts to detect cases and to try and work out what are the, the circumstances that led to um, these infections happening in the first place. We've extended this work recently, and a public, pub paper will be published soon on, in fact, what are the, the distributions of animals that really overlap with these risks, these, these, these areas of high risk. And then we can start to really hone in on those species that we should be targeting to, for, for sample collections and go even one step for, further and look at what are the, what's the potential impact of climate change on the change in the distribution of these, um, these host species, these reservoir species, and what does that mean in terms of where we should be undertaking surveillance in 5, 10, 20 years' time where monkeypox may, be, uh, may, may, may extend to. Uh, a, a group of different organizations, including our own, um, so along with University of California, Davis, Wildlife Conservation Society, Smithsonian Institution, and uh, uh, EcoHealth Alliance, um, are currently being funded by USAID through a program called Predict, Predict. And this is part of the Emerging Pandemic Threats Program. And this is a, a program which specifically funds the kind of work that I'm talking about here today, looking at honing in on these areas of particular risk, high risk for emerging infectious diseases, taking the high risk families of mammals, collecting samples and analyzing them for the high risk pathogens that we think may be emerging. And uh, if any of you are interested in this particular uh, project, this, this is, as you can see, a, uh, a global initiative. Um, you can follow this on healthmap.org uh, slash predict. Uh, and there you can see the different countries we're working and the, uh, the, the, the cases of different diseases that are being picked up in the various countries where we are. So just talking, I want to talk a little bit, bit about the different uh, studies that we're currently doing in some of our sites. And I guess we can really break this down into three different, uh, three different types of studies. Looking at reservoirs, so the kinds of uh, studies that I've just been talking about. Um, what species of animals are hosts to what kind of different diseases that may, may be emerging. Interface studies, so what people uh, are involved in what kind of behaviors, what kind of uh, interactions with wildlife that um, may be allowing uh, viruses to cross over. And, uh, and lastly, you know, some of the issues of secondary spread and pathogenicity. Are the viruses that are crossing over actually spreading? Do they have potential to become pandemic? And secondly, are they causing disease? So one of the things we're doing is partnering with primate rescue centers. And in Central Africa, this is key because you have a large number of animals that are being uh, killed or captured for the bushmeat trade. Uh, some of the younger animals are being sold into the pet trade. And there's primate rescue centers which are um, providing places for these animals to be cared for while awaiting uh, uh, setting up of programs that will allow them to be re-released. And in the meantime, they have uh, acute needs in terms of uh, veterinary care. And these are animals that uh, need a lot of study. And, and we, we don't know so much about the diversity of their different health issues and infectious diseases which occur in these animals. So we have a great opportunity in this case to be collecting samples to help understand diseases of these endangered species that need acute management and also to be taking advantage of those samples to look for the kinds of infections that may go on to, to cause pandemic disease, or to look at, in fact, the origins of certain diseases uh, that, that already exist within people. And just to give you one example of one of the 
the, the discoveries we've made through these partnerships is a, a virus called Parvovirus 4. This is a virus that was previously, it was only very recently discovered, and it was discovered by uh, looking for people who are having uh, signs of uh, acute AIDS infection, so the kind of infection that you have just when you are infected with, with, HIV, uh, with the HIV, HIV virus, so acute HIV infections. And in fact, when they were looking for these infections, they were finding people that were in fact uh, actually infected with a virus called PARV4. Uh, so they weren't in fact infected with HIV at all, but, uh, but with PARV4, and they were uh, picking up the, the symptoms that were associated with this virus. But interestingly, in Europe, at least, this virus is really only associated with people who are injecting drug users or people who are frequently transfused for, for medical reasons. But through our work with wildlife sanctuaries uh, in Central Africa, we also found the same virus in a chimpanzee and a baboon. And in fact, the chimpanzee was expressing very similar symptoms to what we see uh, in people who are infected with this virus. So this is work we're doing with uh, people from the University of, Ed the University of Edinburgh, uh, Colin Sharp and Peter Simmons. And as we've been extending this work, we've actually discovered that in Africa, this virus is much more widespread than, than we initially thought. And it's not just present in uh, injecting drug users or people who are frequently transfused, but in a much broader section of the community. So understanding the role of this virus in, um, in disease and its mode of transition is now really important. We currently don't know how this virus is transmitted uh, in Central Africa. Um, and it, it definitely can't be transmitted in the same kind of way that it is in Europe. That may mean that there's um, vectors involved or other modes of transmission that we currently don't understand. But this is some of the kind of, th of questions that we can explore through these kinds of samples. In Central Africa, there's uh, a very high reliance on wild animals for, uh, for a source of protein. People um, regularly butcher animals. And uh, you know, on, on one hand, this is probably a, a, a requirement of need. In a lot of these areas, there isn't enough production, product, production of uh, domestic animals. So people really, for, for, for animal protein, need to rely on the kinds of animals that they can, they can capture in, in, in the surrounding forests. You know, it's difficult to say that if, if we did increase the productivity of domestic animals in these areas, it's difficult to say whether people would be able to completely switch to relying just on domestic animals as protein sources, because obviously so many people, um, so many families, so many communities relying for such a long time on uh, wild animals as a protein source, there may of course be uh, issues of preference as well. Um, it, it's not just simply a, a, a system of choice where people could uh, stop butchering and, and hunting wild animals and switch to, to domestic animals. There's going to be some element uh, of preference for, for wild animal that, animals that exist as well. But this kind of interaction that people are having with wild animals is really important because there's high levels of exposure, as you can see, to to, to blood and body fluids during the butchering process. And this is a very common behavior in a large number of people throughout Central Africa. <coughs> They're also exposed to a very important group of animals, the, the non-human primates, which are very closely related to us, so we can share a number of different infections. And there's great opportunities for viruses to cross over. So we do a lot of work uh, undertaking uh, surveillance um, at this interface, collecting samples um, where these viruses are, are crossing over. And, you know, this is uh, thinking just about the diversity of viruses that occur out in, in, in wild animals. When you think that, you know, viruses, in fact, what they're doing is really just exploring the spaces around them. They're, they're constantly mutating and constantly um, finding themselves uh, in new substrates, whether that's in, uh, you know, an injury or um, moving from one animal to another. They're really just exploring all of the spaces around them. And where they do find a, a substrate or an environment where they they can reproduce or where they can infect, then they can go on to cause infections. So it's this crossover, this spillover that, that we're really looking to study at this, at this interface. And one of, the, one of our colleagues that in fact helped uh, to set up our program in Cameroon and uh, was around before global viral forecasting was initiated, uh, Professor Donald Burke from University of Pittsburgh, uh, really he named this concept the viral chatter because what we're looking at is these viruses that are pinging across the interface between uh, animals and humans. And we can tune into the voices, we can tune into the chatter that's kind of happening at this interface, at this front line, and try and understand and by listening to the patterns, by observing the patterns of transmission, of, what, of which of these viruses may go on to become, to become pandemic. So working at this interface has been really important for us. Not just for collecting samples from, uh, of, of blood from people to see what kind of infections have crossed over, but also to collect samples from the animals they're exposed to. And, 
you know, one of the strategies we put in place, because we're talking about such a wide range of, a wide geographic range, we're talking about a really large number of different species that are, that are hunted in these communities. It's really work that's well beyond our small teams and the small resources we have. So setting up passive systems of surveillance that really engage people to become part of the research has multiple benefits. It allows us to be able to collect large numbers of samples. So in fact, through this technique of giving out small pieces of uh, a filter paper to collect blood samples that we can use to, to detect disease, to detect infections, um, it has allowed us to collect a very large number of samples. And it's really allowed people to really become involved and engaged in the kind of research that we do. That means that when we come back with the results and all of these communities where we work, we, we're not just collecting samples and publishing results, but working with the communities to bring the results back to, to, back to these communities, to reinterpret them. It means that the, the, the concepts which we come back with, which uh, there's a virus in this animal that was actually healthy, and we don't know if it can ca cause disease in the animal or in people, but we want to study it more, which is a very abstract kind of concept, becomes just a little bit less, less abstract when it's the individual themselves that collected that specimen, and they can, they can bring it back to something that is actually a lot realer for them, that blood sample that they collected from that animal um, that they participated in that research, that research with. So some of the things that we've discovered through this work, um, simian fomivirus, um, is a virus that's found in almost all different species of, of, of non-human primates. Each species has a unique strain, um, and that means that if you give a laboratory technician one of the strains of fomivirus, they can do a very simple genetic test and work out exactly what kind of primate that virus came from, because each virus has its origin in one specific species. People, uh, humans are the only type of primate that does, isn't known to be naturally infected with its own type of uh, fomivirus. But we, in fact, found through the surveillance um, of, this, of these interfaces a number of hunters who were infected with, uh, with these simian fomiviruses. And this is work we're doing in collaboration with Bill Switzer uh, at CDC Atlanta. What we found is that individuals who were reporting hunting of gorillas, which in fact is a very rare behavior in the communities where we're working, uh, were actually infected sometimes with cases of, of simian fomivirus that could have only have come from a gorilla, which really indicated that there is this very real pathway for viruses to cross over. Individuals who are hunting monkeys were infected with spot-nosed monkey fomiviruses or mandrel fomiviruses. And we've extended this work over the last few years, and now there's probably 10 to 20 different individuals that we know that are infected with these novel retroviruses. And we think that these viruses are transmitted through bites from infected animals, although it may also be through contact with, uh, with body, body fluids, blood and body fluids. The T-cell lymphotrophic virus is another group of retroviruses which in fact, HTLV-1 and HTLV-2 are very well-known uh, human viruses that have caused millions of cases worldwide. And in a small proportion of cases of, of individuals, they can cause uh, blood cancer and they can cause uh, progressive paralysis. So these are viruses which are, are known. In fact, they're from the same family as HIV. We know that these particular viruses can cause uh, uh, debilitating illness. And we know that they can go on and spread uh, to become pandemic viruses, which and they, they, at one point had, had an origin. What we found through these uh, surveillance studies is that we can, we've actually found new types, new strains of these viruses. So we know that there's HTLV-1 and HTLV-2, and we in fact discovered HTLV-3 and HTLV-4 in these high-risk communities. The only real explanation for the presence of these viruses in those communities is transmission from wild, wild species of non-human primates. When we look at the, the reservoirs, when we look at the animal samples, and we look at the human uh, samples that we have and, and bring those samples closely together and analyze them, what we can find, in fact, is that in one village where you have animals that are hunted that have, for instance, STLV3, STLV3 is the, the simian or the monkey form of T-cell lymphotrophic virus, and you look at a person from that same village who has HTLV, so the human form of T-cell lymphotrophic virus, you find that, in fact, those viruses are very closely related much more closely related than a virus from another city or from another part of the world, indicating that there are uh, transmission events that are ongoing um, and at much higher levels than what we initially thought. When we use those dry blood spots, we can also get full genome sequence from th these viruses. So it's a bit of forensic medicine that we can do or forensic techniques that we can do on these blood spots to really determine what's the genetic structure of these viruses. And we can compare that to the other viruses we know. So we understand the mechanisms of um, how cancer starts with HTLV-1. Uh, we understand how disease functions with HTLV-1, what part of the gene, uh, the genome of HTLV-1 is very important for disease. And we can see that in these new forms, the STLV-3 in particular, that the same regions of the, the genome is intact 
the, the region of the genome that's responsible for disease is intact. So these viruses um, potentially can be causing uh, disease in, in people with the right number of infections. And again, this is work we're doing with uh, Bill Switzer from CDC here in, Atlanta, in, in, here in Georgia, in Atlanta. So the secondary spread and pathogenesis is a really important part of this work because it's one thing to be finding new viruses and viruses which are occurring within these communities, but it's another to really say, does this virus have pandemic potential? If it does have pandemic potential, is it going to cause disease? Because a pandemic doesn't, uh, infections doesn't necessarily mean it's going to cause disease. So finding cases of spread and finding cases of disease are really important. So far for the HTLVs and the SFVs that we've seen, we're not seeing cases of person-to-person -person spread. Although it has to be remembered that we're only talking about a very small number of individuals that we're looking at, and we're talking about a very small number of different strains of viruses that we're looking at, where in fact out there there is a very large range of different FOMI viruses and T cell lymphotrophic viruses that one of these or another of these may have the capacity to, to, to spread. And we've only been following these individuals for very short amounts of time. Like I was saying, HCLB1, it's very widespread. It's only in about 5% of individuals that you get a disease that's expressed. So in fact, if we're only talking about 5% of individuals that are infected with these new viruses that are, uh, are going to have disease, then we're going to talk about a much larger study than the kind of study which we've been able to do so far. Blood banks are also important pl places to be looking, and we, we do surveillance of blood banks in uh, Central Africa. And in fact, in Kinshasa, there's been cases of FOMI viruses that have been detected from samples that are, uh, that are used in the blood bank. So the, these viruses are already finding in a sense, finding ways that they can spread from person to person, even if the mechanisms of person to person spread through normal behavior, uh, other than blood transfusions, um, uh, may not be possible. So we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, the kinds of studies that we're doing, the kinds of ways that I guess we can say that we're, we are lis listening in uh, to the, the voices at the front line, the voices of the viruses that are crossing over. Um, and involving people in, in the different kinds of research that we're doing and the different ways that we, we undertake that research. But in fact, it's not really just about the research and listening to what's going on. We also have active programs in prevention and reinforcing surveillance systems. So one of the things that we do is to, to be doing risk education for, for hunters, in fact, hunters and people who are butchering wild animals, to be taking some of this information that we obtain back into communities to reinterpret and find what are the different ways that people can be managing their own risk to be preventing uh, these viruses from spilling over into their communities. So this is a program we've been running for uh, seven or eight years now in some of our sites in Cameroon and expanding out to some of the other sites in Central Africa. We provide support to the wildlife sanctuaries for clinical care and diagnostics for the, the endangered species that are occurring there. This is a, a, a chimpanzee that had a case of, uh, of cancer, a, a facial tumor, and helping the, the sanctuary staff gain access to the kind of technology which would allow them to make decisions about treatment uh, of these kinds of diseases is, is key. We're talking about bush, the, 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 the reliance on bushmeat and the importance of uh, allowing people to have choice to be able to access domestic animals. At the moment, that choice just isn't available in many communities. So providing support for um, domestic animal health and for livestock production and livestock animal health is really important. A lot of these communities don't have access to veterinary expertise and don't have access to good information or resources for increasing uh, domestic animal productivity. So that's another part of some of the activities that we do. We also uh, reinforce clinical diagnostics and surveillance systems for much more regular kinds of infections like influenza. This is part of our influenza net surveillance network in Cameroon. We also provide similar support to the HIV surveillance network, um, both in the general community and in the military in Cameroon. We also partner a lot with conservation organizations to try and work out what's the best way of bringing the different messages together from health, conservation, and law enforcement. And it's really important that the different messages from those different, uh, from those different fields are the same message. We don't want to be saying one thing in health that undermines or compromises what people are trying to communicate for law enforcement or for conservation. So finding the right way of communicating in these communities to make sure that the messages are harmonized is really important. So this is work we've been doing with WWF uh, the IUCN and, uh, and traffic. So we talked a lot about the different kinds of viruses that are crossing over, the different kinds of uh, impacts that these viruses can have on our communities. And, you know, I think it's important to remember that, in fact, you know, I wanted to try and, try and finish this, this discussion on somewhat of a positive point, that in fact what we have is 
a lot of these different viruses and infections which are causing major health problems. We have a pretty negative view of what viruses are about. I think that's, that's fairly safe to assume. But in fact, it's a little bit more complex than that. There's no reason to assume that all viruses would necessarily be bad. It's true that the ones that we focus our research on, the kinds of viruses that we see in communities, the vi kinds of viruses that we look at, are going to almost exclusively be viruses which are bad for us. I mentioned smallpox earlier. Smallpox was one of the most devastating diseases that uh, had, has ever really impacted on human health. The elimination of smallpox in the 1970s was a key advance in, the, in, our, in our culture, in our life as a species on this planet. It's a, a virus that we decided to eradicate from the planet, smallpox. And it's now occurring just in one or two freezes, and we're at the point where we can actually decide to completely uh, eliminate the presence of, of this particular virus uh, on the planet. Interestingly, the way that we eradicated this virus was using a very similar and very closely related virus called vaccinia. Vaccinia, or, or cowpox, was a, a virus that, in fact, we loved so much that we cultivated enormous quantities of this virus, and we spread it from one end of the planet to the other. And in fact, not at the same time, not at one particular moment, but we infected every individual on the planet with vaccinia to eliminate the presence of smallpox on the planet. So in fact, we're looking at two very closely related viruses that played two very different roles. Two very different, uh, they have two very different presentations to, to, to us, two very different interpretations of their role for, for our existence on the planet. One that we wanted to completely, completely eliminate and one that we love so much that we spread it far and wide. Those two viruses are very closely related and very closely gen close genetically, but they're on opposite ends of a, of a very, very wide spectrum. And we have to really ask the question, what else exists between these two viruses? And in fact, when I say between these two viruses, of, of course, we're talking about a much broader range of different viruses that, that occur within the entire diversity of viruses that exist on the planet. There are going to be viruses that are bad for us. That's without question. There are going to be viruses which have very little involvement or very little importance to our health, even though they may cause infections. And there are going to be viruses that are going to be beneficial to our health, uh, or viruses that, in fact, we can't live without. And at the moment, we're really only just starting to explore the different viruses that can cause disease in people. And we're starting to develop the tools that we, we need to find and to track down and, and understand these viruses. And for the moment, we don't really yet have the tools to be able to even understand what kind of viruses are out there that are good for us. And we really need to think about, in fact, what are the different kinds of ways that we can explore that question and how are we going to manage our ecosystem, how are we going to manage uh, these different species on the planet. So it's not all just about eradication, but it's also about discovering and protecting things which are going to be either great resources uh, for us as a species that we're going to exploit or species that are, are types of viruses that, in fact, we just can't do without and we need to manage them carefully to make sure that they don't disappear. So I wanted to finish on that positive point and uh, uh, thank, of course, all of the different collaborators that we have um, throughout the world, and I'm sure that there's more that have been left off this particular list, and, of course, our funders, without which um, this kind of work definitely couldn't take place. And finally, I'd like to thank one more time uh, the university for inviting me here, Professor Thomas, for um, discovering our work uh, and uh, deciding to bring me out here to Athens. It's been a pleasure to be able to give this lecture today and a pleasure to be able to, to, to visit Athens to, to, to be here for this talk. Thank you very much. You know, I think it's a really inter interesting question and it really poses the question of, um, it really poses another question of exactly what is a species you know, I think we're getting much better at understanding what a species is when we talk about um, reptiles or amphibians. Um, we're struggling, struggling still a lot with mammals. There's a lot of debate in terms of exactly what a species of mammal is. For microorganisms, it's much more complex. And for viruses, we still don't really understand the ways that we're going to divide up the different organisms into different species. There's concepts of pseudospecies, of many different concepts. So when we're talking about, for instance, simian fomivirus, in fact, it's a spectrum of different viruses that 
um, are so easily identifiable that uh, can't interact with each other, that don't seem to, to be able to recombine to create uh, more complex uh, or mixes of, of virus. So, in fact, we could probably even say that these are different species, but they can infect other types of organisms. They can go on to infect different types of primates. Uh, they can infect, uh, infect people, so a gorilla uh, strain can st cross into a person. But whether it's a strain or whether it's a species is, is difficult to know. Um, so there's a, there's, a lot of, there's a few complexities in that. What we do see is, of course, is um, when we look at very particular groups of bats in particular caves, sometimes it's only one species of bat that will have a particular virus that we're interested in. Um, and of course, as we explore more different bats in more different locations, then we start to find, in fact, there are complex relationships of the same virus over different geographies and different species. But I think that's a really important question, and uh, we don't know all of the answer to that so far. So it, I mean, it's true that our name indicates that we only work on viruses. Um, and whenever I say viruses, I need to stop and correct myself and say microbes because, in fact, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more than just viruses. Um, RNA viruses, which is one particular uh, group of viruses, are prob probably the most important for us to be monitoring in terms of potentially pandemic organisms. But bacteria, um, parasites, DNA viruses, um, you know, all, all of these different kinds of organisms are, are going to be very important for uh, monitoring emerging diseases in many different ways. But if we're talking about global pandemics, then it's probably more likely that it's within the, the RNA viruses. Um, uh, prion diseases are also probably really important to be trying to discover. So in fact, there's a whole range of different kinds of organisms and non-organisms that we should be um, studying. Viruses is something that we focus on. It's an important part of our work, but we also do work on uh, on parasites, for example, on malaria parasites. And we do cover a broad range of different, uh, different, different groups of organisms. So um, it's the same family. So you have a, a family of viruses called the, the Parvoviridae. And it's the same family of viruses that contains this Parvovirus um, called Parv4. Um, there are a whole series of different viruses within that family. So it's, it's a separate virus, somewhat closely related, but from the same family. So, so yeah, there are some similarities. You know, I think there's, there, there is this kind of emerging field of bioinformatics, which I know is mostly associated with kind of genetics, but the, the, the informatics that's related to modeling is going to be really important. I think a lot of our models so far um, are really kind of exploring the, the potential for that field, and we're now at the point where we can start to look back at the models that we started to, to use and see how well they've been at predicting the kinds of things that we, we're looking at. Uh, we shouldn't be thinking just about the kinds of things that we should be just predicting, but the things that we should be predicting and measuring. Um, these kinds of studies should be setting themselves up to be long-term long studies. So rather than just having studies that focus purely on modeling, we should be looking at measuring baselines, doing models, and then looking, uh, looking to be confirming those models in the future. So I think there's a, there are a lot of emerging tools that can be used for this kind of work. Um, but you're right, the, the variability in a lot of these models, the, and particularly one of the, the, the major underlying problems is, is the baseline data that's there, particularly for um, the climate envelopes related to particular uh, vectors or the, the, the knowledge that we have of their distribution or even just the day-to-day -day surveillance, the, the kinds of surveillance that's needed of, uh, of mosquitoes to really know just how they're reacting to different climates is, is, is not happening in a uniform way that it pro is, that's probably needed to feed the data into these kinds of models. So we do have a long way to, to go to be providing effective models for, for this kind of uh, disease prediction. Yeah, I think it's a combination of all those things. I'm glad you've, you've answered the question before, <laughs> be, be, uh, before even asking. But one of the things that perhaps is interesting to add to that is that, in fact, the military is, is um, in just about every country, is, is, is present pretty much everywhere. There's, they're sent for training. They move around a lot. And this is a really important group. It's, a, it's a, in fact, a high-risk group uh, for many different infectious diseases. So if you can develop programs within the military that are effective at reducing the incidence of particular diseases in the military community, then, in fact, you, what you're doing is two things. You're, you're, you're encouraging those individuals to, to be traveling with good information that they can be sharing with people that they interact with. And they can also be um, educated and able to not transmit or not to acquire disease 
uh, when they're on deployment. So it's a, it's a group of people that if you work closely with and work well with, you can have a great impact on uh, the incidence of disease to, to keep it quite low. So it's a combination of all of those different things. Uh, interesting question. So it's most of my, most of my day, in fact, um, you know, if, if I went back, say, 10 years, uh, and looked at what my, m most of my day was about, and I looked at what it, most of my day is now, then things have changed a lot. Um, one of the things that I didn't cover at all in, ter in terms of uh, the things that our organization do does is, is, is managing data. And this is becoming more and more important for an organization like ours. We have an entire team in our San Francisco office, and it's not for, there's, there's a very good reason why they're in our San Francisco office, that deal just with data, accessing uh, surveillance data and different, accessing different data that's available, public data and internet data that can help us to predict and, and, uh, and determine what kind of epidemic events are, are occurring. Um, so if I go back 10 years, there was much less data that we were dealing with and handling. We were much more about setting up these kinds of systems, exploring ways of collecting these kinds of samples. And now we're spending a lot more of our time analyzing that data that we've been collecting over the last 10 years, uh, encouraging and helping other people to set up that kind of work. So a lot of uh, travel, a lot of conference calls, a lot of training sessions, uh, and in fact, a lot of work with government as well. Uh, over the time of doing this kind of work, of consistently producing these kinds of, uh, these kinds of results, um, feeding them back into public health surveillance systems and to government. Government now knows that they have a very good resource uh, in our office. Our office in Yaoundé is 30 or 40 people, so we have um, counselors, we have clinical staff, we have wildlife biologists, we have, psych we have a whole range of different uh, expertises. So helping, helping the government access those different resources within our project is also really important. So, our, our typical day really varies, but um, in fact, a lot of it is actually looks something like this. So. <laughs> How often do you get out into the field? Uh, so we're, in fact, sending our team out into the field probably every other week. Um, and it depends now on what you define as field. Um, the kind of remote field work that you're seeing in some of this, this, these slides, we probably get out there once every month or once every other month uh, when we're in Cameroon. And our team is probably out there you know, once every week or every other week. So I still regularly manage to get out into, uh, into the field for this kind of work. Well, so our organization isn't so much involved with in, in development of treatments. Um, you know, that's something that uh, we would love to be able to be involved with. It requires a whole range of different skills that we don't currently have within our organization. But partnerships with organizations that do do those kinds of things are important. And in fact, just publishing the data allows people to start to strategize and analyze what kind of treatments need to be put together. We're talking about a very short time period, I guess I could say, in over 10 years. What we are seeing, uh, what we have seen over that period is a number of viruses that are crossing over which definitely have potential uh, to cause disease and definitely have potential to, to have secondary spread. Um, we're, we're still struggling with the, the, the mechanisms that we can put in place to prevent that. We know how to prevent it. We know the kinds of behaviors, you saw some of the behaviors that, that allow for those viruses to cross over. Actually, actually elimina eliminating those pathways is really difficult. And we're looking at different partnerships to try and work out how can we encourage people to change their behavior? How can we measure whether people are actually changing their behavior? And what are the different requirements behind those kind of behavior change or behavioral change programs? So that's a really important point that we always have to ask ourselves, that it's not just about discovering, but it's actually about measuring the impact that we can have um, of changing behaviors and of preventing the emergence of disease. That's, that's a really good question. It's a, it's a really good question. We've, we've had a number of different media organizations that have visited uh, visited our program. Um, from, from the US, we've had CNN, we've had uh, ABC, and National Geographic that have traveled out. The, in fact, I think the first group that came to visit us was a journalist from the Baltimore Sun um, in 2004. So we've had a kind of a, a broad range of different people that have come to, to look at our work. And I'd have to say that, you know, as my concern was less about how sensational it would be, but more about how sensitive the journalists would be in portraying the kinds of issues that we're dealing with. Because, in fact, what we're dealing with are behaviors which um, are quite different from the kinds of things that I grew up um, in my neighborhood seeing. You know, uh, hunting and butchering um, monkeys is something that you know, I may have seen it on Indiana Jones when I was, when I was growing up, but I never saw it in, kind of in any other context. So the, the, the way that that was to be portrayed for me was much more of an issue um, rather than the sensational nature. So I was very surprised that almost without exception, all of the journalists that came were very sensitive to this aspect, were 
were um, treated that in a, a very appropriate way. And I think that was key for me that, that that allowed us then to go on to the more probably the more important aspect, which was the sensationalism. And um, you know, I think I found that it's difficult whether it's 60 Minutes or CNN or another organization. They're always going to have a particular angle that they're looking at, and there is that need for a particular catch. Um, and I have to I always have to remind myself that you know not to get carried away in the sensationalism uh, myself, but in fact. It's only sometimes when I step back from the kinds of, um, and see the kinds of impacts that these viruses can have, um, the kinds of pandemics that have been known in human history, the smallpox uh, pandemic, the human influenza epidemic in the early 900s. In fact, these really are sensational epidemics. And um, there is this kind of del delicate balance to, to, to kind of find of, in fact, how much sensationalism is actually, um, is actually real. Um, and I think we've, we've, we've done a pretty good job in man managing that through the different experience that we've had, but there has been that element that we've needed to think about carefully about just what is appropriate. It's, it's a very good point. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, the, the impact that eliminating or eradicating a virus has is something that we really need to be carefully analyzed, carefully model the impact that that's going to have on other viruses. And that may not necessarily mean that we're, it's, not, it's something that we shouldn't do, but it's something that we need to be carefully monitoring the impacts and making sure we have strategies in place to deal with it. And you know, I think one of the things that's, for me, is even more interesting is, is in fact, not viruses that we may acquire that um, will be beneficial to us, but in fact, viruses that we already have, that without which we may not even be able to function. And I think that's, you know, that's where, for me, it's a, a, a real challenge of knowing and, and finding the tools to be able to discover those viruses is something that really fascinates me. So there is a, those two aspects that are, 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 I think, really key for understanding uh, the role um, that viruses are going to play in our future, the, the good role that virus, viruses are going to play in our, our future.